I was one appointment away from shock therapy when I met this doctor. I said, this is my last cocktail. My doctor in New York told me, this is it, honey. This is all you get. We've tried, you've tried everything. Welcome to the Rebel Health Coach Podcast with Tom Underwood. Armed with truth and knowledge, your journey to a healthy lifestyle can be obtained. Preventative wellness, quality nourishment, and daily fitness routines dramatically improve your outlook on life as a whole. And you'll find the support and info you need to accomplish a healthier lifestyle here. Together, we can empower each other along our journey to an amazing you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Rebel Health Coach Podcast. We are going to be exploring hormone replacement therapy over the next few episodes. How many, we don't know yet, but the first of the episode is going to be an intro to bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And my guest for this series, I have two amazing people, Marie Hoig. And Tony Labress. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Marie Hoig before I go into Tony. Marie Hoig is a researcher, a developer, and educator in advanced hormone medicine, estrogen, and estrogen deficiency diseases. She has an extensive professional hormone coaching background of over 15 years in specialty hormone clinic, working with thousands of male and female and transgender patients. She has comprehensive experience with virtually all forms of hormone therapy, both as a clinical hormone coach and personal experience as a hormone patient herself. Her specialties include hormones, endocrine dysfunction, estrogen, estrogen deficiency, ovarian dysfunction, PMS, PMDD, PCOS, endometriosis, menstrual cycle dysfunction, hormone replacement therapies, perimenopause, and menopause. Marie has considerable professional education and clinical training in functional, nutritional, and lifestyle alternative, anti-aging, regenerative, holistic, and integrative medicines with thousands of hours of fellowship, education, and annual outgoing continuing education from institutes such as the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, the Institute of Functional Medicine, Scripps Center for Integrative Medicine, the American Board of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine, the American Board of Holistic Medicine, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, and many other independent alternative medicine institutions. Marie is currently the co-founder and CEO of Panacea Sciences, a research and educational health sciences company that offers advanced bioidentical hormone therapy education, and clinical application training for physicians and physician extenders, and clinical hormone coach training, and education for health coaches. She is a co-developer of Panacea HRT, an advanced, customizable, standardized, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy system, a proprietary formula, and advanced system designed for balancing hormones to a state of optimal and sustainable homeostasis. Marie is also a co-developer of the Panacea Protocol, a functional hormone med- medicine program engineered for optimal ovarian function, hormone optimization, and lifestyle medicine support of Panacea HRT. My next expert on this field is Anthony Labress. Anthony is a certified functional medicine practitioner and a certified health coach. Anthony has practiced in the health and wellness industry in one fashion or another for over 30 years. Anthony maintains a degree in biological sciences through USNY with a minor in psychology. Anthony is very honored and privileged to have served our country in the United States Army as an air traffic controller for four years and the US Air Force Reserves as a medic for eight years. Additionally, Anthony retired in 2014 from the Federal Aviation Administration after a 30-year career as a professional air traffic controller manager. His tours of duty include Alabama, Kansas, Texas, Germany, with a military, and Pennsylvania, Chicago, New York, D.C., Miami, Vero Beach, West Palm Beach, and Fort Myers with the FAA. Anthony's certifications and training programs include FDNP, which stands for Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Practitioner, the Kalish Practitioner, Kalish School of Functional Medicine, 
Functional Medicine University graduate with a 4.0 GPA, whether it be blood chemistry analysis graduate, School of Applied Functional Medicine, level one, certified well guard practitioner, ELSA, LRA, and ACT. He also is a Cresser Adapt Platform, Prague certified, Dr. Brian Walsh, functional metabolism graduate, advanced education in ketogenic diet and carb cycling, and a personal trainer. In his spare time, he enjoys playing ice hockey, weight training, and researching. Anthony's practice now specializes in hormone counseling and BHRT consultations, along with the routine ailments that our clients suffer from on a daily basis. Welcome to today's episode of the Rebel Health Coach Podcast. In this first episode in a series of episodes diving into bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, or BHRT, I have two amazing guests that will be along for the journey with me on this series of BHRT. The first is Anthony Labres and Marie Hoig. In today's episode, we will give you a brief introduction to both my guests and then dive into a brief into bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Over the course of the next few episodes, we will be diving more into this for you. If you have any questions you would like answered along the way, please reach out to me via email at tom at tomadua.net, and we will get these questions answered for you along the way. I hope you enjoy this show. And my first guest up today is Marie Hoig, or Moxie Marie on Facebook. I want to start with you because ladies first, and I really want to know where the Moxie came from. Where the moxie came from? Well, online I'm I'm known as Menopause Moxie, and hello, and thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it, and it's it's my pleasure to be here with uh, Tony too. So, the Menopause Moxie came about, gosh, a f- maybe about five years ago, uh, when I was working at a hormone clinic. And I was reading online, doing some research and on estrogen and menopause. And I came across a lot of uh, misinformation. But a lot of women who have started blog sites on menopause, offering their expertise and recommendations for how to deal with the symptoms of it. And what I was reading was not what I was witnessing in the clinic. You know, these women are really suffering. And so I started my own blog to discuss my personal and professional experiences with women with hormones and menopause and perimenopause and menstrual cycle health. So uh, then when I started uh, talking about, you know, the truth, you know, what I consider the truth with hormones and menopause, uh, there are a lot of women that were unhappy about that. But then there were, a good number of women saying, tell me more. So what do I do now? I get what you're saying, but what do I do? And so that kind of led me to my next venture of opening uh, a company, uh, Panacea Sciences, which we developed an advanced method of HRT and uh, a functional medicine hormone enhancement program. So I've been a bit busy, but that came about really to educate women on what we see clinically to be true, especially with advanced bioidentical hormone replacement therapies. So that's kind of where that came about. And I don't spend as much time on there as I'd like to. Uh, I will uh, here in the near future, but uh, we've just been in development with our protocols and trying to give not only physicians solutions clinically for hormone replacement therapy options, but women too, that they don't have to live that way and they don't have to live through menopause. In fact, they don't even have to go through menopause at all. So, and that's kind of where my stance is and it's controversial and, uh, but it's very clinically effective. That's where I got started on that. Let me ask you this. Why don't you tell the listeners about yourself, how you got into this, the female hormone world of functional medicine, and where you are today with it? Well, I tell you, it's interesting because I started out as a patient, and I started out as a patient who had been on antidepressants and birth control pills from the get go, like most women at puberty. When you have bad menstrual cycles and depression that accompanies them, most clinical physicians, allopathic physicians, 
will put these women on birth control pills and antidepressants. And so I had been on varying cocktails throughout my life and suffered with severe depression, PMDD, endometriosis, menstrual migraines, uh, just horrific menstrual cycles, cramps, mood swings. And so when I finally met a physician about 15 years ago, when I moved back to California, I went to him and said, hey, I'm on this last cocktail of antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. You know, what, you know, can you write my prescriptions? And he said, well, I don't really treat depression as an illness. I'm more interested in finding out what's causing these things. I said, what do you mean? I, I'm 35 and I've been on antidepressants since I was a teenager. And you're the first doctor who's told me that you think you can figure it out. And so that was life changing for me. And so he looked at my hormones and he says, this is why you're depressed and let's get this fixed. And so that was kind of blew my mind. And so I started attending conferences with him and we started working together actually. And so my education and training has been very extensive as I went through this doctor's fellowship with him at the A4M and the IFM, graduating in 2008 at the A4M. But really listening to my first conference in functional medicine with uh, Mark Hyman, gosh, I believe it was at 2008 at the Science and Clinical Application of Integrative Holistic Medicine Conference at Scripps Center. You know, when Mark Hyman was saying, hey, let me, the introduction, functional medicine 101. And so I knew that that's what the approach of the doctor that I was working with was doing. And so we tried to just suck up as much information as we can over the years. And so that really led me to, hey, if we can treat the root causes of why these women are going nuts and going crazy and their minds and bodies are falling apart. You know, we need to offer solutions to teach physicians, you know, to put together a good protocol and teach other physicians how to get the hormones right so women don't have to suffer. So the, so we've learned many different kinds of HRT and we tried most every kind of HRT in the clinic. And so we've been able to see with what works and what doesn't work. And thankfully for the gurus like Mark Hyman and Dr. David Perlmutter, you know, we have some really good information with functional medicine and getting to their root cause. So that's just kind of, you know, I've been doing this since 2003, you know, wow. just sucking up all the education I can because I, I, I was one appointment away from shock therapy when I met this doctor. I said, this is my last cocktail. My doctor in New York told me, this is it, honey. This is all you get. We've tried, you've tried everything. And I think it was on 200 milligrams of Oh gosh, I know I was on 120 of Prozac and I was on 60 of Klonopin and I was on Zoloft, like 200 milligrams of Zoloft. That wow. Cocktail. And that was just so I can get through my day. That was so I wouldn't explode. I mean, that left me very numb so I can actually exist and actually take feed my children and care for them. Uh, and I couldn't, you know, I just, it was going crazy. And so when the doctor first recommended, he said, listen, uh, according to your labs, this is why you're depressed and you don't have a Prozac deficiency. So let's find out, you know, let's figure out how to fix this for you. And so he was a physician who thought outside of the box uh, that a lot of doctors in the area, you know, would say, oh, well, doctor, he's kind of out there, you know, that alternative doctor, but it was that alternative medicine, that functional medicine approach that saved my life. And so I've been on a mission since. I haven't been on an antidepressant since, and that was over 15 years ago. Spent my entire life in this nightmare. And I haven't been on an uh, antidepressant nor had a mood swing since I got my hormones balanced. And I haven't been deep. It's crazy to live a life without depression, I have to say. Um, that's really what made me move this is, is the life-changing things that happen to the brain of the woman not to mention the body, but mostly the brain. Wow. That's a lot. It is. It is. But it's exciting because it's exciting because it's like good news. You right. know, it's like we're not, women are not stuck spending the rest of their lives in their symptoms of misery, you know, because they, they don't have to. And, you know, if you can get the hormones right and the gut cleaned up right, then you can take care of a lot of, uh, anywhere between 80 to 90% of the issues that women go to the doctor for, for mental and physical health issues. 
but you really have to address that. It's not just about hormones. You really do have to address the gut. And that was a process and learning over a period of time too, that that gut microbiome is critical and, and hence really the strong need for health coaches to assist in you know, hormone balancing. Mm, mm, mm. That's good. That's good stuff there. All right, Mr. Anthony or Tony, my buddy Tony here. Tony, you're up next, buddy. Tell the listeners about yourself, your background, and where you studied and what decisions got you into male hormone end of this cascade. You know, how wonderful listening to Marie's story. You can see why I get so excited when uh, when I uh, when I actually started dialoguing with her. I saw a lot of similar, uh, we, we walk similar paths. You know, I mean, um, I am in my mid-50s now, but I remember I wanted, I thought I was going to go into a career in medicine when I was very young and maybe be an orthopedic surgeon and replace joints and, and do all that kind of fun stuff, saw bones. And I thought that was, that was my destiny. But then um, in 1982, I remember 81, I remember seeing uh, Ronald Reagan on television. He was firing all the air traffic controllers that went on strike. And something resonated with me about the job when they were showing the controllers in the tower and, and, and in the radar room. And that really got me excited. And I remember uh, I was applying to the military academies. My parents thought I was crazy because I told them I was going to go in the army as an air traffic controller. And they were so disappointed. And they said, no, we've got your congressional letters. You're going to go to you know, West Point or uh, the Air Force Academy. And uh, I can't believe you want to go in the army as a private. <laughs> yeah. huh. so you had such potential, son. Uh, I said, no, I, wa- I want to be an air traffic controller. That's what I wanted to do. And, and uh, the F- I was too young to go in the FAA. So um, I actually uh, went in the Army and uh, graduated Air Traffic Control School, and I spent four years on active duty in the Army and then eight years in the Air Force Reserves as a medic. Um, and um, so I kind of was able to mix my passion of aviation and a passion for medicine together and really had the best of both worlds for a short time. Uh, I never really stopped the learning when it came down to medicine and studying the body and per- through personal training certification or uh, just working with my, my own body, doing just an incredible amount of research. Uh, we don't have the, we didn't have the resources back then that we do now, so it's actually wonderful and it's much easier to do research. Uh, well, for the most part, it's easier. <laughs> but um, and, and then um, I, I, everything was going really really well. Um, I hit about uh, seven or eight years in the FAA, and that bug hit me again. And I said, you know what? I, I really am getting older, and I really wanted to take a shot at med school. So uh, I went and uh, attained my biology degree from uh, University of the State of New York, and um, with a minor in psychology, and I applied to three different medical schools. I said, I'm going to give this one shot. Let's see what happens. Took my um, uh, my exams and applied to the med schools. And unfortunately, I didn't get in. I didn't get into either. I was, I was very disappointed, as a matter of fact, when you get one denial letter and a second denial letter and a third denial letter. And then, you know, you look at your grades and say, what else do I have to do to get in these schools? I thought my grades were good enough, but I didn't. And um, whether it be destiny or uh, whatever the case, I ended up sticking with my career in the FAA and 29 years later, I retired. But in the meantime, I knew I was, uh, I was destined to find my niche somewhere because I wasn't just going to retire and, and drop off the face of the earth at, in my fifties. So, um, about five years or six years before I retired. So it's been about 10 years of practicing one way or another. I kept looking for different avenues to train. In other words, I, I was looking at allopathic medicine and it wasn't quite attractive to me. So I ended up, um, looking for, um, uh, I was, I was unbeknownst to me back then, I was really looking for my calling in functional medicine and root cause type therapies, um, and detective work. And there just wasn't any training available back then. So, um, I just kept studying and, 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 and learn, being self-taught. And I actually worked with a few clients unofficially, um, uh, pro bono type, uh, policemen, uh, firemen, low testosterone issues, um, uh, depression, um, with the things that I had learned. Then uh, fast forward to about my late 30s, I started realizing that uh, I didn't have any reason to be mildly depressed. I didn't have any reason to be um, not feeling well. Um, but I noticed that uh, even with all the work, the working out and the ice hockey and all the things that I was doing, I was very active, that I wasn't, being, I wasn't able to maintain the level of performance um, and certainly the body composition that I had once been able to, make, to, to, to attain through that same level of conditioning. You know, when you when you think in your late thirties, uh, every life was really good, uh, great occupation, lived in a wonderful place. Everything should be great. I mean, there was there should be no um, uh, no to no mild depression, no feel, no ill feelings. And for some reason, I just couldn't figure it out. Something was really bothering me. Um, so then I did a very deep dive into chemistry, 
did some self-teaching, partnered alongside of a, a PhD chemist discussing my issues and uh, paid for a few consults. And um, this actually back then, you know, when I went to my, my physician, you get the same old story and, and uh, everything looks, looks fine. You know, of course, he didn't test the right hormones, didn't, didn't do the right testing at all like we would do nowadays. And um, uh, so it was going to be up to me. And I knew that. So uh, through we actually did saliva testing back then. <laughs> and even in saliva, the testosterone levels were, were incredibly low. The estrogen levels were unfortunately very high. So that gave me my first glimpse into actually troubleshooting my own personal issue. And through that process, you know, never on any type of medications other than um, just the necessary to get through day by day. Uh, I noticed some joint pain too, that uh, thyroid was starting to deteriorate. So um, no doctor would give me testosterone therapy. When I requested the service, nobody, nobody would give it to me. Um, most couldn't even be literate. We couldn't even have a conversation about it. So uh, I decided I was going to have to take matters in my own hands, and uh, I actually went to an overseas, overseas resource. And my very first experience with testosterone replacement was actually quite interesting, um, using a, a testosterone powder and actually um, diluting that in DMSO. <laughs> and using DMSO as a carrier oil to make a, a, a solution, a mixture for one to two drops, delivering three to four milligrams per drop of testosterone onto my skin every day. And just doing the, the first time I experienced it, just doing the one drop, which was, I believe, three milligrams, um, I, I actually, the very first day, felt a little bit better. You know, I, 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 the fog hadn't lifted completely, but I felt a little bit better, just overall sense of well-being. The second day, I moved it up to six milligrams. The body normally plays, puts out for men about seven to 10, 11 milligrams of testosterone a day. And I actually went, moved it up to a six milligram dose. And then I felt a, a very profound improvement over the ne next two days. So that was kind of my journey in, into the beginnings of testosterone replacement therapy. And that was almost 20 years ago. Since then, I've accumulated um, a lot of training. We've come a long way. Now it seems to be more and more accepted. Uh, although the delivery methods and the, uh, the, the skill level of, of the physician is crucial when delivering uh, TRT uh, for men and uh, you can call it optimization because that really is my goal is to optimize, uh, whether it be through health coaching or, or hormone replacement therapy. So um, that's pretty much the short version of the very long story, Tom. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's talk about, that's like a BHRT 101 today. So we can give the listeners a, a little idea what we're talking about as far as BHRT versus traditional hormone replacement therapy. So. How does BHRT differ from traditional hormone replacement therapy? Well, I mean, you know, my thing with, you know, we had to, in our clinic, we had to really break it down, the differences between hormone replacement therapies so that we can educate not only patients, but physicians. Because right. not, not all HRT is the same. And so we broke our HRT down into generations so that we can explain the differences with patients and what they can expect. So as a coach and educator, you know, when patients say, oh, well, I'm on hormones, but I don't feel that way. Well, because you're on different hormones. And so all generations of hormones have different clinical outcomes. And so um, the to explain the different generations, we'll probably answer all your, your questions with hormone replacement therapy. So I'll start with the first generation. First generation HRT are typically the, the oral, uh, orals like birth control pill. They're synthetic, they're, they're synthesized, they're, they're manufactured with chemicals in a manufacturing plant. Uh, this generation of HRT, typically the, these hormones are dosed at low doses, uh, very low. Doctors are told to dose at the lowest dose possible dose for the shortest amount of time, the same dose every day. And these, some of the um, brand names are Premarin and Prempro and your regular birth control pills. There's no real education or training and doctors are reading how to, reading the package insert of the samples of these hormones to prescribe them. There's no real education. These types of hormones tend to stop working within weeks, one, because they're so low and that they're at the same dose every day at such low doses that they just stop being effective. So these are your synthetics. The second generation are 
what we would call compounded or bioidentical. So they can be bioidentical because there are pharmaceutical bioidentical hormones. Most of what we're talking about with bioidentical hormones are the compounded creams that you get from uh, compounding pharmacies. This mindset too is the, the difference between the first and second generation are the synthetics and bioidentical. But it's also dosed at a lowest dose possible for the shortest amount of time. It too is dosed at static dosing, same dose every day. And some of the brand names are uh, Vivel Dot, Estragel, the stuff that you get at your general practitioner's office. There's some education by the drug reps, but not a lot. And there's no clinical application training to it. So the doctors, again, are trying to read the package inserts on how to use these. But also there is some training. In fact, this is what the A4M, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine and the Institute for Functional Medicine, this is what they teach physicians. So if you were to, a typical doctor would go and get alternative education to learn how to balance hormones, they would typically go to one of these institutions and then this is what they would learn. They would learn the low dose bioidentical designed to treat the symptoms of hormone deficiency, but not fix the, as the hormone deficiency altogether. So it's symptoms management with low dose. And these hormone replacement therapies tend to stop working in about six to eight months, maybe nine months, some sometimes less because they're at such low doses and um, they stop working. But this generation more than any other generation creates an estrogen dominance effect in women. We didn't see estrogen dominance 10 years ago until doctors started writing this kind of HRT. And now there's a lot of women with estrogen dominance because there isn't enough estrogen in the system to naturally detoxify the estrogen out in a timely fashion. There's a big difference between these two and it's how the hormones are administered in the manner that it's administered. So third generation are compounded bioidentical creams, meaning bioidentical, they're derived from a plant, but still synthesized in a pharmaceutical plant. So you can't take a, the molecular structure of a, a, a Mexican wild yam does not mimic a human molecular structure. So there needs to be some synthesizing. So there's really no true, you know, plant-based hormone. There is some synthesizing. Well, third generation now you have a different dose. This is not low dose. Now this is what we call an intermediate dose, a medium dose. It's higher than the low dose. But one of the biggest differences with this is the is the rhythmic, the way it's administered. It's it's administered in a way that mimics the natural physiology of each hormone. So when you administer estrogen, the dosing is going to mimic that natural hormone tied physiology, whether it's with estrogen's hormone cycle or progesterone, those hormones are dosed in that manner. Doctors that do this, there's one brand name that I know of, and that's the Wiley Protocol. And there are other doctors who have done and who've been taught the second generation HRT who found that it clinically stops working. And they have taken themselves to the next level of education and sought out advanced HRT training. So these doctors will do this or they've developed their own hormone uh, rhythmic dosing protocol aside from the Wiley protocol. So there are a few doctors that do this type of HRT. There's some, some training, some clinical training, but no application, no clinical application training. It's a lot better than first and second generation HRT with results to clinical outcomes, but there's still many clinical flaws. And it was our experience with the Wiley protocol that it really only works on about 20% of our patients if we dose it according to uh, the recommendations of Wiley's protocol. So we found that, you know, it's it's tough to use a, a protocol that stops working after a while. But so that leads us to the fourth generation HRT, which is really kind of a derivative of a, the Wiley protocol for most physicians. So the physicians that have been trained how to do the Wiley protocol experienced a lot of the clinical flaws in it uh, of it. You know, their patients were doing so much better on this HRT system, but the patients didn't want to get off of it because of how good they felt. But the doctors were just having a hard time getting the hormones right and fixing the depression in the luteal phase. And there were, you know, there were just some, you know, clinical issues that women were willing to tolerate, but they were, you know, kind of extreme for some. Uh, but doctors were like, okay. And then they tried to figure out how to, how to dose it just right by listening to the patient.
And so with fourth generation HRT, you know, doctors, it's a compounded bioidentical. It needs to be formulated in a compounding pharmacy. But with fourth generation HRT, the uniqueness between, well, there's a lot of differences between third and fourth generation HRT, but one of them is the the dosing optimization with it. Fourth generation HRT is considered a high dose. We call it adequate dosing, giving a woman enough hormones so that it's circulating in her bloodstream. And so we want to we want to dose in a physiological manner. And what that means is giving a woman enough hormones that mimicked what she looked like in a state of her reproductive prime or what she should be in her reproductive prime. And a dosing it is so you're matching the natural hormone tide cycle with the way it's administered. And you're also giving enough hormones that actually makes a significant difference over the brain and body of a woman. And so with this system, there is some education and clinical training. And uh, you can get to a, a specific hormone sweet spot in a, in a range where a woman feels her best, where there are minimal clinical negative indicators and the lab work concurs. And so this one is really the most advanced and effective. So this really kind of lays it out that there's more than one way uh, to balance hormones. And there's a difference between synthetic and bioidentical. And so, Tony, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I mean, and I'm talking specifically about female hormones. I mean, I know when Tony speaks, he's really uh, coming from a perspective of men's health and hormones, uh, but there are some general um, similarities between the two. To sign up for my monthly newsletter, text RHCP, that's Rebel Health Coach Podcast, or Red Hot Chili Peppers, to 22828. Again, that's RHCP to 22828. Thank you and have an awesome day. Yeah, really well said. And and that's one of the reasons that I, I get so excited when I hear Marie talk about it. I mean, is it controversial? Sure it is. Um, mm-hmm. But there's been many things that have come come to fruition that were that were uh, controversial uh, in in life period, let alone chemistry and biology. So yeah, as far as men, um, the picture's a, a, a bit simpler. Not that uh, I, I don't talk about it in generational ways. I talk about it in you know testosterone. We always want to replace testosterone with testosterone. We don't want to use derivatives of other steroids to kind of uh, bind to androgen receptors and and with for different outcomes. That's just talking about hormone replacement therapy, just uh, physiologic doses. So with men, you know, I mean, testosterone was discovered in the 30s. Um, we probably, I'm not sure if uh, your listeners may have known of Dr. Jonathan Wright out at the Tahoma Clinic out in the West Coast. And he, he wrote, to my knowledge, the very first prescription uh, for bioidentical hormone replacement um, in 1982. And in the show notes, you're actually going to see a video that he, that he posted, that uh, Tahoma Clinic posted. And it all started from uh, uh, this goes this goes back um, to eighty two. A female client came in, menopausal um, woman came in and said she wanted natural estrogen. She told him to his face, and he said, "Well, started writing. I think it was Premarin. He was writing a prescription for Premarin back then." And she goes, "Well, I wanted natural estrogen." And he said, "Well, this is what we have." And she says, "Isn't that from a horse?" And and he said, "Well, yeah." And she, she said, well, I want natural. I, you know, I mean, the estrogens are in there. Is that the same estrogens that are in my body? Well, not all of them. And she said, well, you know what? I'm going to come back in three months and maybe you'll have this all figured out. So Jonathan Wright tells the story that he goes on in, in a search to find uh, uh, chemists and, uh, with, with the answer for identical hormones to the basic three estrogens that women have. That's E1, E2, E3. And he was able to find some uh, a, a compounder, I guess you would call him a compounder nowadays, a chemist, that said, yeah, I think I can do that. He was in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I couldn't find anybody in the United States. <clears throat> so a few weeks later, he called him and says, well, all right, now what doses do you want? It? And he said, well, he really didn't have that answer. So he started going to uh, lab, lab companies saying, um, with young, healthy women, where are your target ranges for these women? And, and, and that's how Triest came to be um, the three estrogen, the 80-10-10 formula, estriol, estrone, estradiol. 
And I linked that, uh, Tom, you'll have that in your show notes so people can actually watch that video. There may be other um, people that have came beforehand, but he, he claims that that was pretty much the first time that it was written. And that's, that, that was kind of the genesis. And now we have all these compounding pharmacies that can do some wonderful things. Marie, do you have any background on that? I'm not sure. On Jonathan Wright? Yeah, on that particular scenario. <laughs> No, not on that particular scenario. Uh, Jonathan Wright's education, yeah, we learned that in second generation HRT. And yeah, and that's where, you know, he is certainly is a pioneer in the HRT industry. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's doing today, but, you know, I don't think anybody writes, well, I don't think anybody writes a prescription for Triest anymore, maybe Bias, but not Triest. But yeah, that was really interesting just doing my homework on that and actually watch. It's only a six minute video of, of his statement, and it's actually very interesting how things come to be, you know, and, and how things just take off, which it, it very well, this fourth generation uh, may very well be the next, the next thing, you know, the next thing to actually take off and, and women are really going to thrive because that's what we're after. We're after optimization and, and, and a maximum uh, enjoyment in life. Uh, you know, we've had our family members, you went through it personally. I went through it with family members and uh, th- there's no reason to suffer in menopause. There's just no reason to do that anymore. So um, as far as men go, um, you know, like I said, once those, once that um, all these feelings of, you just can't put your finger on it, something's wrong. I don't know what it is. Um, If you ignore that, then it's only going to get worse. It doesn't get better. (laughs) So uh, it it just, it goes into a tailspin eventually. And then, like you said, then you have the SSRI prescriptions and, and all kinds of, and eventually maybe an antipsychotic if it gets bad enough. So uh, yeah, it's, testosterone in men, extremely important. It is the male hormone. Well, Tony, wouldn't you say that there's just a lot of misinformation on andropause and the conversation about male menopause? Yeah. I mean, there's just like even periandropausal men, it's just men don't realize that they're going through the exact same thing women go through and that it's normal and they don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Men, Men seem to, you know, doctors uh, many times uneducated, uh, you know, uneducated doctors don't ask the right questions. Um, the 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 men don't, you know, sometimes they're embarrassed to discuss these symptoms of what's happening in their body, especially if you go to a female physician and they don't want to have that dialogue with the opposite sex. Um, but they just most men that I talk to, their eyes light up when you start having this discussion about, hey, there's help here, there's help available. My the panels that I run, my serum panels that I run are very comprehensive, but for less than $300, we get a very clear picture of what's going on in the body. So I, I implore men to actually, you know, if you're going to spend any money anywhere, spend, save your pennies and spend uh, less than $300 for a good quality lab panel. So folks like us can actually look at it with a physician and actually we can coach and come alongside somebody to improve their life uh, drastically. I'm not saying every man has to go on testosterone. Um, so I don't want that to be misconstrued. There, there's certain things based on the lab work that we can do to, to actually help them. But yeah, lifestyle changes, um, all the things that come along with it, nutrition, exercise, that sedentary lifestyle is a killer. You know, sitting in the office under dim lights, fluorescence, uh, and not getting outside. And when you do go outside, you put on sunglasses, circadian rhythms, cortisol elevated, all of these things are players. And Tony, don't you find out too, uh, what we found clinically, as I'm sure you do, is these sim- the symptoms come on over a more gradual period of time yeah. than women's where there's just like hot flashes and signals and everybody is in on it because a woman doesn't shut up when she feels so horrible. Yeah. But a guy it just kind of is conditioned to kind of suck up his his uncomfortableness, whatever it's, if it's physical or mental, and they keep kind of, it kind of keeps adding on over this gradual decline. And they're like, and then you've got this, who is this guy? You know, who is this guy I'm living with? You are not the same, just like men say, who's this woman? You know, it's like, you know, but yeah, I think it's becoming more and more socially acceptable for men to say, Hey, yeah, I feel like crap too, honey. You're not the only one, you know, I want to feel good too. And, uh, and that's where, you know, health coaches like you fit in to help these men say, yeah, it's okay. This is socially acceptable. And yeah, you don't have to live this way. I mean, I, I do like the simplicity and balancing hormones, as you know, for men is different than women. I mean, men are quicker, less knobbies to, to dial in in a shorter period of time. And, you know, they get a quicker turnaround result, you know, and yeah. And it's really nice to see that before and after with men. It's, it's very rewarding. I know that I've, you know, found that as I'm sure you too, watching men transform into the men that they 
you know, used to be or always wanted to be. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, uh, I want to go back a little bit to Marie and talk about the estrogen dominance leg of this. And we'll get into this more in another episode, but, you know, there's a lot of talk out there about es- too much estrogen, estrogen dominance, but estrogen is very important. Yeah, there's a lot of misinformation about that. And I mentioned that, you know, when we were starting HRT many years ago, over 15 years ago, women didn't come in with estrogen dominance. This wasn't something that we saw a lot of. Usually we saw a lot of estrogen deficiency. And the main school, the main hub of education for training physicians on alternative hormone therapies, alternative than allopathic conventional, like first first generation HRT. Because there's, when you don't do a rhythmic dose, when you're not dosing your hormones or administering the hormones in a way that replicates this hormone physiology, then you don't you don't trigger a receptor response. And receptors are very important in detoxifying estrogen. And if there isn't enough circulating estrogen in the blood of a woman, she's not going to be able to detoxify the estrogen out of her system and methylate it appropriately. A woman needs to have enough. And so doctors that are misdosing hormones and doing the low static dosing because you're not getting this upregulation of receptors, then you're creating an estrogen dominance effect because receptors are important because it's it's vital in the way that the hor- the, the hormones are received, the way the hormones are uh, circulated and utilized, as well as how they're detoxified and methylated out of the system. This all needs to be done in a timely fashion. And if a woman is just given low dose hormones all the time, every day, and this doesn't trigger a receptor response, then the body, there's no way to detoxify it out of the system or utilize it. And most of these women will show low estrogen levels because it's not circulating estrogen. And so when you're estrogen dominant, you have all the the symptomology, uh, sore breasts, bloaty, gut dysbiosis, inability to sleep, moodiness, irritability, horrible menstrual cycles. And the doctor keeps trying to give them different types. And a woman will go from one doctor to the next thinking, oh, well, you're alternative. You do bioidentical hormones. Yeah, but he does low static dosing. And so this creates an estrogen dominance effect. And so when we get these patients into the clinic and we see that there's... they're on low dose hormones, you get them on the right hormones and start triggering this, this, this peak of estrogen on between days 12 and 13 is what triggers this receptor response. And so when you get a woman's hormones balanced, you need to upregulate enough receptors so that her body can receive the hormones, utilize them where it's needed and get rid of them in the timely fashion. Otherwise, a woman will just become estrogen dominant. Okay. And give a brief explanation of rhythmic dosing for people that don't know what rhythmic dosing is. Rhythmic dosing means um, that you want to dose the hormones. There's a, and a, a, I'll post a chart or it'll be in the, the okay. show notes chart on how the hormone tide cycles work. And that's what we're trying to mimic. Okay. So if you look at how the estrogen is produced in a 28 day cycle, there is a peak that happens at day 12 in the follicular phase. And there's a drop at a low at day 18. And there's another peak at day 21. These peaks are very critical. The the follicular peak is really critical. If it's high enough, this is when the receptors are triggered, not only for estrogen, but for all the other hormones in the female body. So the progesterone now works as the calming hormone. If a woman is taking progesterone when she only has low estrogen or she's taking low dose estrogen, then the progesterone doesn't act as the calming hormone and acts as a depressant and an anxiety antagonist. And so when you dose the hormones in a way that you're triggering a receptor response in the follicular phase, then the secondary peak in the luteal phase with the peak of progesterone, this is progesterone's peak, these two peaks help shed the lining of the uterus. 
And so it helps the progesterone work better. It downregulates the progesterone peak, downregulates ester the estrogen receptors. So it all supposed to function like a fine oiled machine. Progesterone has its peak, estrogen has its peaks. And if you create recreate these peaks with the hormones, then the body thinks it's doing it on its own. Right. And so the body's functioning the way it's supposed to, not with low flat hormones. You get low flat dosing hormones, then all you're doing is creating an estrogen dominance effect where a woman can't detoxify it. They're just, if you cycle the hormones and you don't necessarily have to cycle the hormones to be able to detoxify, but you need physiological dosing, meaning that you are also mimicking the levels of a healthy reproductive female, not just at such low doses to treat the symptoms of estrogen deficiency. Okay. The goal is to fix the estrogen deficiency issue altogether, not just continuously chase the symptomology of estrogen deficiency with low static dose hormones. Okay, awesome, awesome. Tony, to you now, dosing for men for testosterone, I, I know because I've been through it, that the doctor just hands you a vial or tells you, gives you, writes you a, a script for a vial and says, here's, Shoot this in your butt once a week. <laughs> and, and you're lucky to get that. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and yeah, exactly. Because you usually they'll just first start you on a cream. Andrew, yeah. Right. Andrew gel, which is, we all know is like putting deodorant on your underarm. It's like Premarin and Prempro. Yeah. It's, it's uh, the equivalent of a low static estrogen. Yeah. Yeah. It causes more problems. Uh, so yeah. I, I know that, you know, like I said, this is what the doctors do, and you're giving yourself one one shot every week, and that's not mimicking the natural cycle of testosterone either. Sure, sure. So, what is what is your? I mean, so the male males have the same rhythmic dosing also. So, how do we fix that? Yeah, you know, um, the delivery systems are interesting. Um, you know, from pellets to patches to creams to injectables, they had a buccal for your mouth. Yeah, no, and my in my experience, which is it, it's pretty extensive, what I see works best is small, frequent doses, just just the basic body rhythm doses. So, if your body, for example, for argument's sake, is putting out ten milligrams a day, something similar to that, introducing to in, uh, the peaks about nine to ten a.m. in the morning. So if you're, if you're dosing at that rate, you're going to get a very favorable response from the body. In other words, you're not going to get uncontrolled estrogen levels. You're not going to get uh, red blood cell macro issues where you're going to have problems controlling red blood cell size uh, and or volume. But you are taking over the axis that belongs to the body. So when, when you do that, when you take over the HPTA axis, when you start to interfere with that, there are some inherent responsibilities that must come along with that. So you have to understand the luteinizing hormone cycle, uh, the feedback loops, the other hormones that are involved, and many of which we probably still don't know to this day. So when you shut down the body's feedback system, then it should be um, the physician's responsibility to make sure that those missing links are at least addressed. And when I say the missing links is, it's not just as simple as putting testosterone in. In my experience, where men thrive the most is small, frequent dosing, and, and I would choose injectables as my my uh, my choice. And it's not the uh, the old school days of a harpoon, twenty one gauge, inch and a half needle in the rear of your butt. <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. A very uh, an insulin pin um, that diabetics use daily for insulin uh, to deliver it, maybe twenty eight gauge is fine. And and you can even do sub Q injections. I've I've had good results um, following clients with sub-Q, and I've had very good results with just a small IM injection in their shoulder or their thigh. Um, no worries whatsoever. And, you know, like uh, Marie had said, you know, men are so different. And, and frankly, they're just simpler. I mean, that, there's, no way, there's no way to get around it. Women are much more complicated. That axis has many more moving parts. Right. Um, but the men, like, like Marie said, it, it, after a few weeks, maybe a month or two months or three months, they may come back on the old the old dosing schedules, the, the one shot a week or the one shot every two weeks, um, where they get a big bolus dose, 250 milligrams all at once, and the body says, what did you just put in me? And how am I going to manage all this? Um, and then all kinds of crazy things happen. And then the, ro the beautiful roller coaster ride starts. The, the, first, the first couple of days, you might feel great. You might feel on top of your game. Things are better. Your mental acuity is sharp. Everything's feeling good. There's no fog. 
And by day six, seven, eight, nine, ten, the, the crash starts, the downward slope starts. And by the time you're you're ba- barely walking into your physician's office for that next injection, and that's not the way we want to do it. Anybody that's doing that, that's listening to this podcast, needs to go and find a new physician. So uh, we we don't want to we don't want to do it that way. But um, in my in in my experience, um, DHEA, I do backfill the DHEA pathways based on their levels, and most often. Uh, pregnenolone. If I hear of any complaints of brain fog, not thinking clearly, that normally is an indication sleep problems. Um, that normally is an indication maybe 30 milligrams at night before bed of pregnenolone. So it can filter down into all these other hormones and all the other pathways that frankly, we're just not aware of. Um, that's the body's rhythm. That's what the body wants to do. We just took over that pathway. We took over that axis. We, took, we, sh- we shut down the feedback loops. So there's going to be inherent problems outside of simply just testosterone alone. So, um, yeah, that's, um, my, that would be my favorite, but some men don't want needles. So they'll do the creams, absorbability issues, consistency. It's less predictable in my opinion, a little more aromatization. So conversion to estrogen problems, not everyone, not everyone. Some do fine on it, but case by case basis, my personal choice where I've seen the absolute best results, very consistent, small doses, more frequent. All right. The physiological dosing is really two simple concepts. It's either one, it's either high enough dose to make a difference, and this could be static, and or it's dosed in a way that mimics the natural physiology of the way that hormone is secreted. And with men, our, my little experience is a little different. We did the rhythmic dosing in our clinic for men, and we did not get the same results as a rhythmic dose for women okay. with a transdermal cream. You know, with a higher dose and a rhythmic, just, you know, there are different reasons, but you can use a high dose testosterone therapy and be static and have it, have it be in a physiological dose. You just want that dose high enough to make a difference that it actually changes brain function and body function. And so it could either be, but it can be static. I don't want you to think it doesn't have to always be dosed in the same format as the rhythm of the hormone. It, that's just one way that you can do it. But in our experience, we couldn't do that with men. So we had to go with a static high dose. So. Okay. All right. So before we end today's episode, what, how can a listener or listeners know that a BHRT is right for them? What is the, some of the symptoms they're noticing that they should address to say, hey, maybe I should look into this? Okay, yeah, for women, um, there, there are a lot of women that are on hormones right now right. and still have all the symptomology of low estrogen. Okay. I mean, they're, they're, and they're also on medications to treat the symptoms that the hormones are taken should have taken care of. So these women, I would highly recommend that you really think outside of that box and find a a clinician, a physician who understands this physiological dosing, who will give you enough hormones that there's enough circulating estrogen in the blood to change brain and body function. So uh, I wouldn't even mess around with first and second generation HRT just because it doesn't, you're not going to get enough and you'll create an estrogen dominance effect. What about men? What's some symptoms that men should look for knowing that I need to, you know, I need to look into this because this is some of the things I'm suffering with. Yeah, not that not that low libido um, testosterone is 100% um, the issue with low libido, but that's one of that's one of the signs. Right. Erectile right? dysfunction, the diminished intellectual capacity. You're not as sharp as you used to be. Uh, starts out with low grade depression, so you'll you'll start to see why. Why am I feeling this way? I should be. They're, they're, everything's going pretty well in life. Why, why, uh, why do I feel like I do? Because it doesn't feel normal. Very lethargic. That's another thing. Things that you were able to do, it takes you a lot more um, concentration, energy to actually complete the task. Osteoporosis. I mean, you see men, um, I, well, especially with the, the more aged men, um, really just a, a loss of bone mass and muscle mass. I mean, just we need more muscle. We need to keep it on our body um, metabolically for many reasons. But so th- those, uh, if you notice the belly fat, the mid belly fat that you didn't have before, start to accumulate at a faster pace. That's that's an issue. Um, the classic man boobs. If your chest boobs are sagging, right? If if you <laughs> if you ha- if you can't see your penis when you're at the urinal, um, <laughs> if those are all issues that should get your attention, right? That, you, that should wake you up. That's the wake up call. Right. That you're probably a little bit late to the party, but you need to seek assistance. Okay. So that dad bod thing. 
F dad bod all the way. Yes, absolutely. So, but then you get to the point where you see, and I saw this the other day, is that it was a father and son. And sadly, the son's body was almost a mirror image of the, the dad bod that his dad was walking around with. So it started, it started at a younger age. Yeah, you'll, we'll see that. I mean, you know, my, I have, you know, the client base I have, and I have some younger, some younger men, plenty of data. Um, it's really alarming, the low T rates, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in the future, yep. but the, the low T rates and the elevated estrogen rates, right. just the exact opposite in their, in their 20s. I'm not talking about the 30s. I'm talking about the 20s. Very alarming. So um, we need to wake up. We need to um, bring attention to this. And Marie and I just, that was one of the reasons we, we wanted to do this. The word needs to get out. It needs to be circulated. And as much good information, does everybody have 100% of, um, of the information are required? Probably not. Is everybody 100% correct? Probably not. But we need to have the discussion. The right. discussions need to be had. Right. Uh, and, and that's what's most important right now. We have, we have methods out there that are, have proven to be very successful. I lack the clinical experience with women that um, Marie has because she's worked in that and, and she's developed the process, her, her and her uh, partner. I've worked with a lot of men, so I'm very familiar with it, not only at my level, but with many, many clients. You know, it's, there is help and it's available and it's out there and we're going to teach you um, how, to, how to seek out better practitioners to get those answers too. Exactly. All right. Good. I think that's a that's a wrap for today. I, I mean, I, that gives a brief, you know, overview of where we're headed. And uh, I'm looking forward to this. I know we're going to get to there's going to be some controversy along the way. It is what it is. And I know we're going to probably, you know, some of the people out there that, especially when we talk about estrogen. And the whole cancer issue that that'll come up, and I, you know, I'm looking forward to talking about that because there is a lot of misinformation about that, and keeping physicians and patients scared of estrogen. And so this is why I'm doing this is to really clear the air on that. Yep. Bracca, uh, the Bracca gene, the Bracca gene, right, Tom? Right, Tom. Right, Tom. <laughs> the gene. Yeah. Oh no, I'm not going there today. Self mutilation. That's yeah. yeah that's just a crazy. It just drives me crazy. Crazy. So, yeah. All right. Thank you guys for hopping on today. Appreciate you both for taking the time, and I can't wait for the next one. Looking forward. Thank you, Tom. It was a pleasure being on your show. Thank you for joining in today with the Rebel Health Coach, Tom Underwood. And be sure to subscribe to the show so you can catch all the episodes. With desire and commitment, you can implement a lifestyle of wellness and fitness. For the support, encouragement, and tools you need to be successful, visit TomUnderwood.net.